Salutations. A prestigious member of the Third Academy recently asked me for my thoughts on a certain book, and I found it interesting enough to warrant a video review. The book in question is The Quantum Hermetica by Olivia and Ethan Palmer. The primary purpose of this book is to demonstrate that all developments in physics from the early 20th century until now are consistent with idealism and are inconsistent with materialism. Its secondary purpose is to create a theoretical framework with an ideal basis within which physics can be understood. Before we get into the various positive and negative aspects of the book, I shall put it simply that in my estimation it succeeds at both of these tasks. So how do the authors handle the quantum part of the quantum hermetica? It is incredibly common for snake oil peddlers waving crystals around to make vague references to quantum tomfoolery in order to make their nonsense sound appealing to materialists. Transmedium vibration ectoplasm. So one of my major concerns going into this book was that it would contain watered down distortions of pop science articles. Having taken a serious look at the most interesting citations, I can say with satisfaction and confidence that this is absolutely not the case here. The quantum physics claims made by this book are accurate representations of the findings of peer-reviewed papers. All in all, the Quantum Hermetica has a whopping 172 citations despite being only about 90 pages long. It is thoroughly researched and this is clearly visible. On a tangential note, the authors seem to have gotten the wrong end of the proverbial with regard to the relationship between physics and the intelligible. Their manner of discourse has the apparent effect of folding being down into the realm of profane science. This is not a flaw in the theory itself, merely an inherent limitation that goes unmentioned. In my own opinion, it should always be the priority of discourses like these to act as an exhortation to the contemplation of superior things. It is impossible to ascertain intelligibles by dianoia or aesthesis, and therefore no theory conforming to the scientific method can possibly provide a complete account of them, not to mention that which precedes being. Now let us move on to how the authors handle the Hermetica part of the Quantum Hermetica. The book's primary source on the doctrines of Hermeticism is the Kabbalion. Ah boy, here we go! This was my second major point of concern. For anyone who does not know why, I have left a link in the description to a video by The Modern Hermeticist which ought to clear this up. In short, while the Kabbalion is certainly hermetic in certain ways, such as its teaching that the One is the All, that man is a microcosm, that mind underpins matter, and that God produces out of himself rather than from nothing, it also makes use of concepts which are found nowhere in any hermetic literature nor in any ancient texts whatsoever, but are in fact very clearly derived from the teachings of the New Age pseudo-religion called Theosophy. This having been said, just because something is not authentically traditional does not mean that it is not true, and on that matter I shall allow the Kabbalion to speak for itself. Moreover, the Kabbalion does present a complete and cohesive system which is internally consistent, allowing the authors to successfully achieve the secondary purpose of their book. So to summarise, if what you are looking for is a clear, concise and well-researched exegesis on the conformity of contemporary science with not only idealism in general, but also certain specific doctrines, then this book is definitely worth getting. If you already like the Kabbalion and would like to see it supported with science, then this book is definitely worth getting. If what you are looking for is something in close conformity with the Corpus Hermeticum, then I'm afraid we're not on the same page as the authors, so to speak. Not a joke, but an incredible simulation. Now we will go chapter by chapter to get a closer look at what the Quantum Hermetica has to offer. After an introduction to the principles outlined in the Kabbalion, the second chapter surrounds the principle of mentalism. This is the idea that the universe is mental, or that all is mind. The authors introduce us in a simple but informative manner to the history of quantum mechanics, outlining various experiments and the conclusions of eminent physicists. It then goes through several theories that deal with the universe as information, rather than as matter-energy, and makes sober comparisons to computer simulations which help to illustrate the concepts. The authors also make a demonstration of mentalism by starting with the famous observation of Descartes, cogito ergo sum, 
combined with an appeal to the parsimony of monism as opposed to Descartes' own substance dualism. This is, in my humble opinion, the best chapter in the book. And if you know any materialists you wish to educate, then this will certainly come in handy. Unfortunately, the discourse is limited by the fact that the Kabbalion does not define what it means by mind. It's all in my head. It's all in my head. Whereas in metaphysics there are very clear and fundamental differences between suke, nous, logos, dianoia, noeron, logisticon, thumoides, etc. These things have a clear ontological hierarchy and cannot be mixed together into a nebulous concept of mind. The information from which the universe is projected is psychical, not intellectual, in nature, and is still subject to the logic from which we derive the prior existence of the Aedai, or forms. If we were looking for a platonic explanation, we would say that these data structures either are, or are the products of, the Logoi Spermaticoi, or seminal reason principles of material objects, which are quite far down the chain of being. The third chapter covers the principle of correspondence, which is authentically hermetic and derived from the Emerald Tablet. This is the notion of, as above, so below. What occurs at one level of reality has a corresponding shadow or reflection in all the others. The talk of such levels, or planes as they are known here, may to some invoke imagery of planescape and spell jammers. There's over seven realms. What? There's <laughs> what? <laughs> But the authors do an excellent job of explaining that what is meant is not a series of three-dimensional universes separated by a fourth, but a series of sets of prevailing conditions which are non-spatial. The simulation analogy is used to great effect in illustrating correspondence in this chapter. I especially appreciated the point that outer space is predicated upon inner space which is one of the major themes of Jeremy Nadler's exegesis on the ancient Egyptian worldview found in his book, Temple of the Cosmos. The book briefly mentions the existence of daimonia, beings who lack physical vehicles, and takes the opportunity to exhort the reader against the worship of the gods, essentially arguing that they ought to be ignored. This strikes me as anti-hermetic. Becoming assimilated to the gods is a persistent theme throughout the Corpus Hermeticum, and the Asclepius specifically encourages the creation of statues of the gods for cultic use. Ancient writers such as Iamblichus invoke hermetic texts specifically in their arguments for why worship of the gods is a good thing. Renaissance followers of Hermes, such as Marsilio Ficino, himself a Catholic priest, believe that the gods gather and focus the divine energies into specific activities, such that ritual veneration of the gods would more effectively utilise these specific energies than general purpose prayers to Jesus or Mary. The authors also list archons as malevolent entities, despite the fact that the Corpus Hermeticum teaches that the seven planetary archons are entirely good wardens and benefactors of mankind, who ought to be observed in order to know the will of God. This is followed by a section dealing with the collective unconscious of Carl Jung. The usual complaint that people have with Jung is that psychoanalysts reduce the transcendent down to the psychical, but I will defend this usage here, in that what the Quantum Hermetica is describing is entirely psychical to begin with, such that Jung's ideas are entirely applicable. The fourth chapter begins by describing various paranormal phenomena related to the principles previously described such as remote viewing and astral projection. The book provides brief explanations of each with references to solid scientific evidence. This section is highly informative and corresponds with things mentioned on this channel in the past. Only one phenomenon here strikes me as problematic in its explanation, which considering the number listed and my inherent scepticism is a remarkably good record. The authors make it clear that the individual mind exists even without a physical vehicle to house it, and that it can exist in a so-called etheric mode, yet they also postulate that what we experience as daimonia are from their own perspective physical and organic creatures living in Newtonian universes like our own. Do you suppose they have any life on other planets? What do you care? You don't have any life on this one. <laughs> Now, their case for why such alternate simulations are possible is perfectly sound, but applying this to Daimonia is a problem for several reasons. 
Firstly, the reason why we deduce daimonia as a category in the first place is the necessity of an intermediate nature between the psychical and the material in order to make them a coherent continuum. That is, there have to be mediating powers by means of which the code is translated into the simulation. Such entities cannot exist in the same simulated state or this would create an infinite regression. Secondly, while Daimonia do traverse the celestial spheres, the sub-lunar daimons have always been understood to be permanent residents of this very same world in which we live, and specific locations are frequently reported as their dwellings, yet they exist in a state which does not physically interact with our own. It is Daimonia that preside over the various partitions of physical nature, as their very name indicates, and if they existed in their own physical world, they would require Daimonia to preside over them, another infinite regression. Moreover, the traditional teachings tell us that when we encounter these beings, we are not interacting with physical bodies, but with phasmata. Chapter 5 covers what is called the principle of vibration. As with the chapter on mentalism, the scientific research is impeccable. So far as we are able to determine, the scope of this principle found in the Kabbalion does not extend beyond psychical activity, which is the origin of motion according to three of the four schools. There does not appear to be anything in the attested physics that does or could potentially contradict this. Chapter 6 covers phenomena that can be linked to this so-called vibration, albeit with widely varying degrees of credibility, as any attempt to integrate such disparate phenomena into a single system is bound to end up with some tenuous reaching. Overall, I don't think that the connections are more or even equally useful than the existing traditional theories, as ever your mileage may vary. Chapter 7 covers the so-called principle of polarity. This is the notion that opposites exist at polar ends of a single scale, and can therefore be transmuted along the scale to intermediate states. Thesis and antithesis. The conflict is inevitable. The Kabbalion uses the example of heat and cold, but I think this is incorrect. Cold is the privation of heat, just as darkness is the privation of light, as any physicist can tell you, and as the ancient philosophers well knew. Cold cannot be transmuted into heat, darkness cannot be transmuted into light, nothing cannot be transmuted into something. These are negative terms, there is no such thing as a mean between heat and cold, there are merely differing quantities of heat. There is also no possible scale between limit and the unlimited, so the poles of the indefinite dyad itself speak against the universal utility of this principle. Chapter 8 covers the principle of, of the and is a section for which I have no criticism whatsoever. Following a general description of temporally repeating patterns and waves, the chapter introduces the cyclical changing of humanity's collective mental states, which are well documented in all the world's traditions. Anyone familiar with the content on this channel ought to already be aware that we are living in the winter of the world. I hate the future. <laughs> Chapter 9 goes over the principle of cause and effect, which is precisely what it sounds like. What is interesting and much appreciated is that the authors make use of this chapter to explore apparent violations of causality relating to free will and quantum probability. From the perspective taken by the authors, conscious choice manifests as quantum probability, which as delayed choice experiments prove can retroactively determine the states of particles. On these grounds, they dismiss neurological experiments which purportedly do away with free will by showing precursory brain activity prior to decision making. They are right to do so, as such conclusions are utterly absurd, requiring such neuroscientists to define free will as something that doesn't involve the brain in order to be coherent. The book goes into detail about how symbols can be used to influence people, even on a mass scale, and manifest bizarrely coincidental effects vicariously. I was very amused by the use of Keck and meme magic as a demonstrative example, having been somewhat involved in those events myself. Chapter 10 covers the principle of gender, the teaching that there are masculine and feminine properties in manifested things. 
By masculine is meant active, actual, generative, and ordering, and by feminine is meant passive, potential, receptive, and fertile. This is practically identical to the Chinese concepts of yang and yin, respectively, and also rings true for the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, with form being masculine and matter being feminine, intellect being masculine and soul being feminine, amongst other things. The authors touch briefly on the modern mercantile project of subverting nature that I am sure you are already aware of, and point out quite rightly that this ideology prevents the people under its sway from achieving their full potential. The final chapter queries after the origin of occult science, and concludes that due to its correspondence with current physics, it must have originated from a technologically apt, industrialized civilization dwelling on another planet. Indeed. This section manifests clearly the attempt to approach the subject from a profane and modern point of view. It also displays an overwhelming progressive tendency. The notion that a civilization must be advanced in mechanical technology in order to grasp occult philosophy is to me an absurdity. The two things are, from all orthodox points of view, antithetical. As immersion in the material world increases over time, apprehension of divine and metaphysical principles necessarily deteriorates. For an example, simply read the Asclepius, a fundamental hermetic text. The fact that physicists are able to achieve the results described in the Quantum Hermetica, and yet fail to divert onto the path of returning, is a monumental testament to this process. If these scientists could perceive the same underlying reality that their ancestors could, they would take up thergy and sacrifice at once. This chapter also describes the use of occult science by certain among the modern regime, with references and citations. My audience will probably not need much convincing of this, but if this book is used to introduce a former non-believer to these topics, then they may find this part to be very revealing indeed. In any case, that concludes my review and commentary on the Quantum Hermetica. I hope that I have done it justice. If you have enjoyed this content and haven't simply fallen asleep at your computer, I have a Subscribestar page where you can help to support me in making more. Link in the description. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day. And by the way... Piece of spaghetti on your overalls. <laughs> Luigi.